Thank you for spending an hour with us on this uh, summary Thursday evening. And we're going to get right to it. But um, first, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about what our plan is for the evening. Most of you, if you are green drinkers, you, you, know, the, you know the drill. But for newcomers, uh, we uh, talk a little bit about who we are and what's coming up. And then I'm going to introduce our speaker, Andy Tate, uh, director of Eco Foresters. And uh, so right this minute, I'm just going to let Katie Morris take it and talk to you a little bit about our virtual format here. Katie? Thanks, Katie. So I know a lot of us at this point are familiar with Zoom, but as a quick reminder, or for those of you that are not, this is a webinar, so we can't see or hear you, um, but we're glad that you're there. And you should be able to see and hear us and then see Andy's screen throughout the presentation. And then you should see at the bottom of your screen, and you might have to sort of scroll your mouse down to make the menu pop up. There's a Q&A option. So feel free to put your questions in there at any point throughout the webinar. We'll take questions at the end. We'll let Andy go through his presentation first and then field questions, but feel free to drop them in as they come to you. There is also a chat option. We won't be using that a lot, but if you have some sort of technical issue, feel free to let me know and I'll do my best to help you work through that. Great, thanks Katie. And we do this uh, different ways with different speakers. So Andy says he's got a very full plate this evening and um, is gonna kind of roll through it. So instead of breaking to answer questions, uh, we prefer that you bring them in um, whenever you have them, but we'll field questions at the end of his talk. So thanks for that. Green Drinks is sponsored locally by Conserving Carolina and Mountain True. These are two of Western North Carolina's best environmental organizations, and we encourage you to be members if you're not already. Um, we are also sponsored by Appalachian Coffee Company, where we hope to be again someday when we're able to safely get together. I must say I really miss seeing you guys and having that community of folks uh, for green drinks. But, um, we have planned green drinks through the end of 2020 through December. And as it stands now, we'll continue with our online uh, webinar format. And, but we'll let you know if, if things should change. So um, green drinks, what is it? Uh, green drinks is actually an international movement that uh, happens all over the world. We're one of 500 chapters. And people like us get together and talk about and learn about the environment. So sometimes they just talk and sometimes they have a speaker like us. Um, but uh, we usually have a very uh, informative speaker, which I always look forward to once a month. We're the second Thursday, so kind of keep us in mind. On August 13th, Tony Dunn will be with us. Tony is a retired fire ecologist and he and his wife moved here as climate refugees from Paradise, California. And um, they barely escaped those horrible fires in 2018. Tony's talk is titled Paradise Lost, How Climate Change is Devastating Our Communities. On September 10th, Hume Davenport, the founder of the nonprofit South Wings, will talk about how he and his group assist local environmental organizations by taking them up in small airplanes. For example, when we're driving in our cars, we've all seen the power plant on Lake Julian, the, the smokestacks as we're on I-26, but if you're up in a small airplane, flying low, you get a whole different perspective of what's going on on the ground. On October 8th, we have author Danny Bernstein, and Danny will be introducing her new book about DuPont State Recreational Forest. Last year, when we had Sarah Landry come and talk at Green Drinks, we, we had a really good crowd, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, Danny's talk should be really interesting, too, and um, 
we'll, we'll get the story that she's put in book form about how DuPont came to be in public hands. So for today, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Andy Tate. Andy's been director of Eco Foresters since its inception in 2015. He oversees all the company's Southern Appalachian forestry projects, including forest stewardship planning and timber sale administration. Prior to this position, he spent six years conducting on the ground research on forest restoration at the US Forest Service Southern Research Station and Bent Creek Experimental Forest in Asheville. In addition, he's done hands-on ecology, ecologically beneficial stewardship on both public and private woodlands in Western North Carolina. So welcome, Andy. Thank you, Katie, and thanks to uh, both Mountain True and uh, Conserving Carolina. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so you can all see my contact information on the slide there and feel free if you have questions that don't get answered during this presentation or you want more information, feel free to email me, call me, whatever is easiest. Um, I'm happy to uh, continue the conversation offline with you all. Um, I do have a lot to get through, so I may move kind of fast um, on some things to give you kind of an overview of things. Um, so quick uh, overview of the presentation. I'll start with a quick introduction to ecoforesters, what we are, what we do. Um, and a brief history of Southern Appalachian forestry. It's really important to understand that. And then get into what is positive impact forestry and how do we do it? And finally, give some incentives for people to be good stewards of their forests. So um, the title of the presentation, Positive Impact Forestry, is something that you may not be familiar with. And it's, there's four terms on the screen that we use kind of interchangeably all those things, whether it's positive impact forestry, ecological forestry, ecological beneficial forestry, restoration forestry, or conservation forestry, basically trying to raise the practice of forestry uh, to really do some good in our woods and make a positive difference out there. So if one of these terms speaks to you more than others, let me know, I'm happy to always get feedback on uh, what is the best term that people uh, resonates with them. So quickly, Ecoforesters, we are a professional nonprofit uh, consulting forestry organization uh, dedicated to conserving and restoring our Appalachian forests. And we do this through educational events like this and through actually doing uh, on the ground stewardship work. We, we do consulting forestry work for, uh, for landowners in the area. Um, so again, we are a uh, consulting forestry organization. Most of my time is spent with landowners um, on their woods and helping them be better stewards of the woodlands, writing management plans or stewardship plans, and also doing everything to invasive species control and then conducting a hopefully ecologically beneficial timber harvest as well. Uh, it can be done, it's done well. We do outreach and educational events, usually in person, um, but this is our first try at an online one and I'm excited to, for this new opportunity. Uh, we also do uh, collaboration with other conservation groups in the region. And we have pretty advanced capabilities to do remote sensing of properties. Uh, we can tell people the heights of their trees across their property right from my desk, uh, analyze the slopes, even find old roads and tell if a timber harvest happened out on a property recently or even decades ago. Um, so we're constantly looking for new information, new technologies to help uh, make our work more efficient and to have a greater impact, uh, whether it's on a small individual landowner or across the landscape, work on, on both scales there. Um, so a quick overview of some of our uh, conservation collaboration work. We have uh, started up our Sandy Mush Forest Restoration Project, which is a community uh, 50,000 acre watershed northwest of Asheville. It has a lot of conserved land in there by uh, the Southern Appalachians Highlands Conservancy. The land, um, like a lot of land you learn, have been badly degraded because um, of the past history of management and abandonment. Um, so there's a lot of great potential there, but also a lot of work can really benefit things out there. We're trying to have a positive impact out there on that valuable conservation community. We also have staff that are working on the Nantahala Pisgah National Forest Planning Process. That's been going on for about six years now. I just finally got uh, the final comments submitted and hopefully we'll have a plan uh, soon. It's been a very long process and monthly meetings. We work also with all the local uh, conservation groups I mentioned the SAHC, uh, Conserving Carolina, uh, the Nature Conservancy even did actually an oak restoration timber harvest on a Nature Conservancy preserve in Tennessee. And we've also done work with the Foothills Conservancy, among others. 
Um, one of our biggest clients is the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, they're really doing some great forestry work out there and they got 50,000 acres of forest land on their tribal lands and they're really trying to do some great work restoring it out there and getting back to their cultural values on there. That's been very exciting for us. So that's kind of some of the highlights of our conservation work we've done um, on things. So the next thing to kind of dive into the presentation on positive impact forestry. Why do we need positive impact? Why do we have to restore our woodlands? And um, the reason right there in front of you, you can see those are uh, chestnut trees. You know, 100 years ago, there were plenty of these. 25% of the Appalachians was possibly made of chestnut trees. And some of them, as you can see, were huge, eight feet in diameter. These were the redwoods of the east, a fantastically valuable timber resource, very rot resistant, also great food source for wildlife and people alike. Um, so they were, of course, obliterated in the 1930s and 40s by the chestnut blight. And so there's been a great drop in that significant timber value, but also in that wildlife value, and a huge part of our ecosystems was lost during that. The tragedy of the chestnut blight, that's probably the most dramatic change to our forest over the past, you know, 100 years or so. Um, another thing that went on, most of you may not be aware of this, but also in the past 100 years, virtually all of the Southern Appalachians has been essentially clear cut. Uh, the trains came through in the 1870s, and all of a sudden these vast woodlands that these steep mountains they couldn't access, they now had access to them. And this was just pure, you know, resource extraction. This was not, you know, forestry. It was just uh, getting as much of that timber to the booming cities on the East Coast. So vast, vast swaths, mountainsides were laid bare. There was erosion. It wasn't done properly at all. Um, there were massive wildfires with all this down debris you see in the pictures burning afterwards. It even burned up soils. You know, the Erosion caused fish to die in some of the streams. It was was pretty a major impact, and everything you see now, with a very small, very small exception, um, is second or even third growth forests that have come back, and they've come back fairly well, but not nearly what they once were, you know, 100 years ago or more. Um, now, no one really liked <laughs> all that clear cutting. It's not a very popular thing, so it doesn't look good, um, and it had a lot of negative impact. So the change had been that. Well, instead of clear cutting, we'll do, we'll just cut the trees that have value, um, which essentially is what's called high grading your forest. You're cutting the best trees and leaving the rest trees. Um, they'll often use terms like, oh, it's a selective cut, um, or just they'll use the phrase a diameter limit cut is usually how it's implemented. They cut all trees that are above about 16 inches in diameter, and that is the point at which trees become economically valuable. So it really is just taking out the valuable trees what we'll learn here is that those trees are the best trees. Those are the trees that have, have got the best genetics to adapt to the site and grew the best. And so removing those is taking the best trees and the genetics of those best trees off of the sites and degrades the forest, often leaving behind, as you see in those pictures, you know, very spindly little skinny trees that are not healthy and vigorous. And the trees that are left in the lower picture there often get damaged by the bigger trees being felled, or the trees that are left have forks or other deformities that are not as strong structurally that give that tree a less uh, optimistic future, really, of it surviving because of the structural deformities to it. So again, it leaves behind a very degraded forest, and that's been the common practice and still goes on to this day, because this is the simplest way to make the most short-term income off a timber harvest, is to just cut the valuable trees and leave, maybe damage the rest, and there's a big impact across the whole forest. So that practice is something that we're trying to get beyond and actually then do restoration to hopefully restore these forests to some of their past um, grandeur. Another big factor is uh, past hundred years have been fire suppression. You see that graph up top there, um, you know, two to three times per decade, oak forest, the drier oak forest burned either naturally or through prescribed controlled burns, either intentionally set by the Native Americans for thousands of years, and then for the early settlers for decades and even a couple centuries after that. But since 1910, there were some bad fires and all that clearing was going on. They decided the fires were bad then and tried to suppress all fires since then and got very effective. Smokey the Bear came on the scene and there's been a great absence of fire that has really changed and also degraded our forest. This, uh, you know, 100 years of fire suppression. You can see those two pictures down there. Um, 
a lot of times the forests around here are very densely vegetated. The understory, the real dense thickets, just about impenetrable to get through. And it's not real good for tree regeneration. It's not great for wildlife to have a lot of forests like that. Certainly some forests like that is a good thing to have, but we have a lot of those very dense understory forests now and not many of what you see in the lower picture there. That's a forest that has had a prescribed burn and it really knocks back that dense thicket in the understory and allows fresh regrowth to happen, which is more palatable wildlife forage, makes it more open also. I mean, the early settlers talked about used to be able to ride their horses through the forest, even two or three abreast, no problem. Um, and that's something that you pretty much can't imagine doing anymore. And those, that picture above there, a very dense thicket, can't even walk through them sometimes. So it helps to open things up, get more sun to the forest floor, it stimulates the new growth, it's a diversity of trees started and also opens up more fresh forage for wildlife. So fire suppression has really dramatically reduced the structural diversity in our forest as well as the species diversity are two big things I'll talk about. Something that can really help our forest now is a little more, um, little more good fire going through. And a lot of organizations, Nature Conservancy, state and federal agencies are trying to do a lot more prescribed burning now and have realized the benefits of it. Um, so, um, <clears throat> Another big impact has been non-native invasive insects, diseases, and plants coming in. We mentioned the chestnut blight, the upper right-hand corner. Chestnuts, and they get about three, four inches in diameter. The fungus of the chestnut blight gets into the bark, ruptures the bark. Chestnut trees die before they can get any sides at all. Uh, the balsam woolly adelgid, that picture in the top middle there, up on uh, Mount Mitchell there, and that's where um, all those Fraser fir trees, if they were killed, the mature ones were killed by the balsam willy adelgid back in the 60s and 70s, and it's still around having an impact too. The hemlock willy adelgid came in around you know, 2000 down here, and that has wiped out probably 90% of our hemlocks have died and many more are declining. They've managed to spare a few with, you know, insecticides can be used in some things, but it's greatly, greatly reduced hemlocks around here. And then invasive plants, and the one I've pictured here in the bottom right is kind of the public enemy number one for invasive plants. That is oriental bittersweet or Asiatic bittersweet. And those are three or four vines there, you know, three or four inches in diameter that are actually climbing up a tree. And they can do this in the full shade of an undisturbed forest. They climb a tree, literally kill a tree, bring a tree down, and then spread out and stop the forest from regenerating. I've seen acres actually of forest that have been just covered up Trees have killed, been killed, fallen over, and bittersweet has taken over the forest in some significant patches. And that's a, a major ongoing issue we have. It's still really impacting us today. And we'll talk more about that as an important thing. Um, so those are the main things in the past that have gone on. And now still going on, we have more invasives coming in. <clears throat> the <clears throat> emerald ash borer is probably the most devastating new one that's come in there. I've seen this out there, it's killing ash trees. Again, the vast, vast majority of ash trees, virtually all the ash trees um, that it infests do die. And you can see there, one of the big points of my presentation is a diverse forest is much more healthy um, and much more valuable also for a lot of reasons. And you can see why there's a street in Toledo, that street on the left was they wanted to make it all matching and they planted ash trees along the streets to make it very uniform, nice formal matching thing. And then of course, Emerald Ash Borer came in and killed all those ash trees so that all the trees lining their forest or lining their streets are supposed to look really nice, all of a sudden have dead trees there and doesn't look nice at all. Um, so it's very important that you have a diverse forest because we do not know what the next, you know, insect that comes in, what species it might target. Because most of these species do target, most of these insects do target specific species or groups of species of trees. And that's really why you need the diverse forest. So at least it doesn't wipe out your entire forest or your entire street here. It allows other things to take up that's growing space and the forest overall will be less impacted. Um, thousand cankers disease also affects walnut trees. It hasn't been too bad yet, but still causing some problems, killing some trees, especially around town where trees are more stressed. And the gypsy moth has been registered now in North Carolina that can defoliate and kill oak trees among other trees and oaks are already having a hard time. So here are the potential future problems coming up for us um, and who knows again what's next. So keep a diverse healthy forest. Um, the better, more diverse it is, the better it is to withstand other non-native things coming in and damaging them. 
So some of the challenges with you know, forest management, you look out here at this forest and we have you know, literally two and a half million acres of, of forests here in Western North Carolina. And it looks beautiful and it is beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. Um, but what we see out there because of that past history of clear cutting, it is all very kind of middle-aged forests. There's a midlife crisis they say the forests are having. And they're not really structured the way they would be for true natural disturbances to happen in the forest. And that has greatly changed the forest composition of species of species in the, in the forest. And it also has greatly changed the structure of the forest. It's a very even canopy and a very closed canopy with much shadier and moister conditions underneath that canopy on the forest floor. Um, so what would have happened in a more natural, fully mature forest or an old growth forest is about 1% of the forest would be naturally disturbed every year. That'd be through wind storms, uh, snow or ice storms, fires passing through, or even just natural mortality of old trees falling over. If you had 100 acres, at least one acre per year would basically essentially be cleared through natural processes, natural disturbances going on out there. Um, and that's not happening in these younger forests now with a very flat canopy. They kind of shelter and protect themselves. There's no more fire. And they aren't old enough to have much natural mortality of the mature trees out there. So it's, a, it's much less structural diversity in the forest. Um, so we have a lot of forests, but not that great a diversity in the structure of them. Other thing is because it's very shady in the understory and there's no fire, they're seeing a transition from the trees that are in the overstory, especially oaks that are very valuable. You'll, we talk about oaks a lot. It's a very valuable keystone species for wildlife and very valuable economically. Oaks have been declining for decades and that's because these moist conditions and shady conditions favor things like maples and birches and heath. And heath is rhododendron and mountain laurel and they've formed much more dense thickets in the past uh, decades. Um, so that's really changed things. And the lack of fire, oak was fire adapted. Most of these other trees are not as fire adapted. So it's changing the, the composition of the species in our forest to make it a little less valuable for wildlife as well as for uh, humans for timber value out there as well. So these are some of the common challenges we've seen. Some other challenges we talked about, non-native invasive plants. Um, one of my colleagues has a great quote, it, just because it's green doesn't mean it's healthy. That picture on the lower left there, it's a wall of green, very you know, vigorously growing forest there. Unfortunately, virtually everything you see there is a non-native invasive plant. And that's a common sight around the edge of disturbed forests, especially around town here, we see that quite often. You see bittersweet, those vines covering it are bittersweet, literally killing the trees, and tree of heaven, the non-native invasive trees also coming in there. Those are probably the two worst offenders you'll hear me talk about in terms of non-native invasive plants. Um, climate change. We don't know the exact effects, but it's definitely changing things, and it turns out that there are trees that are better adapted to deal with climate change than others, and also having a diverse, a diverse forest, diverse uh, species as well as diverse structures helps forests be able to be buffered from the impacts of climate change. So we want to keep diverse, healthy forests so they can be better adapted to climate change that comes. And we can actually manage them to make them more adaptable to climate change and more able to withstand the effects. Uh, another common problem is that picture on the lower right there, uh, because of the past high grading of harvesting all the biggest, best, and most valuable trees, there's really very low economic value. So people can't generate income from their forest and it makes it hard to maintain, just being able to pay for the income and upkeep of a forest. Forests, unfortunately, do not take care of themselves anymore. We, we've had enough impact, all things I've talked about, that we need to go on there and, and do some work to make sure we are taking good care of our forests because we have, again, much less diversity of species in the forest. We have lost species, I mentioned chestnut and hemlock and ash now, um, and other species like oak are declining. And there's also a lot less structural diversity. Again, a lot of those middle-aged forests, not much of the very little old growth and very little of the young growth too in forests. And we'll talk more about all these things in the upcoming slides. So we, we have all these problems. There's the bad news for you. Uh, sorry for all the bad news first but get it out of the way. Um, there have been things that have happened to damage our forests and they're not quite as good as they could be. But what can we do? Well, we have these past conditions. We, we can't you know, change the past, but we can take where do we want to be in the future? What do we want from our forests? What are, what are your goals for your forest? And we can make a plan to do some work to do restoration forestry, to have a positive impact on your forest and make it better in all forests. So how do we do that? 
Well, the first thing to go out there and, and do an inventory and see what species you have in your forest, what's the health of the forest, what's the structure of the forest, what are the objectives of the landowner, land manager, how do they want this forest to be? Do they want wildlife, they want clean water, they want recreation, they want timber value, do they want carbon sequestration? Um, and it, these are all things that take a long time to plan for. Forestry is usually done planning by decades. You write a forest management plan, it's good for 10 years at least before you have to reassess it. Um, so you have a plan to get you where you want to be to hopefully restore your forest, um, improve it, but you have to be able to implement the plan, actually put some, some time and or money into the forest to improve it. And hopefully that investment will pay off to you in the future as well. And as always with things going on, especially with climate change, you have to go on and every 10 years go in and reassess and see if what you're doing is working and maybe you have to adjust a little bit. So that's an important thing. Um, things that you can manage your forest for. I mean, there are some requirements the state has are called best management practices, BMPs, that protect water quality. That's one thing that you have to do if you're managing your forest is protect water quality. Um, any forester should do at least sustainable timber management, which means they're not cutting more than the forest can regrow. That's not a problem around here, actually. We have forests that grow very well, and we are actually growing much more timber than we are harvesting around here. There are a lot of other things you can manage for. I mentioned biodiversity is really important. And the wildlife biodiversity tends to mirror the forest's structural and species diversity too. So making a more diverse forest tends to create more diverse wildlife populations too. Uh, aesthetic beauty is really important in recreation. Talk about non-timber forest products, you know, ginseng and mushrooms. And you actually can do ecologically beneficial and profitable timber harvesting on, um, on forest land. You can do it and make a profit doing it. That's important. And of course, if you have special sites, any rare, threatened, or endangered species or habitats, uh, preserving those is really important as well. So that's kind of the full suite. And uh, for positive impact forestry, you have to look at all of these values, not just the timber value of the forest, but everything out there. There's a lot of values in forests. And of course, it's just the, the value people put on forests that you can't put a number on. People just love forests. And that's, that's really important to consider as well. So all those things are key. Um, this is a slide that I really like. Um, it shows you the incredible diversity of forests around here. Um, we have about a dozen different, distinctly different forest types in the Southern Appalachians, and that's probably the most diverse forest outside of the tropics. So this is really a special place. Um, without getting into details here, we have, you know, around town in the floodplains, the Montana alluvial floodplains forests, you know, things like Sycamore, River Birch can be common in those areas, but you won't find them other places. Um, and the bluffs above the rivers in the lower areas, you'll find these shortleaf pine or oak forests here that used to be very common. There used to be millions of acres of shortleaf pine, a real keystone species that was great for wildlife. Uh, a lot of work's been done to restore that because it has decreased by maybe as much as 90% from its historic range. Um, then you go up into the coves around here, the streamside coves, the rich coves you see here. Rich coves have the most productive soils. These are also often the most productive farmlands, lies were cleared for agricultural lands. Um, and now they're regrowing second growths, but they're not quite as good as they once were. But these are the most diverse forests. You can have easily 50 species of trees growing here and hundreds of species of herbaceous plants, very valuable productive things. Water quality is important there. The acidic coves tend to have rockier, more acidic soils. So not as diverse, but still things grow pretty well there. A lot of rhododendron, hemlock in there. And then you get up into music oak and drier oak for as you go higher up. And it turns out we essentially have all the forest types here in the Southern Appalachians that you would have between here and Canada. Because as you go higher up in elevation, you get up to 4,000 feet, you get up to the northern hardwoods. These northern hardwoods are what is common in New England. And we have them around here, just higher up the mountain. And you get up to 5,000 feet, you get up to the spruce fir forest. These are the forests that are across Canada. Um, we have them here. You just have to go pretty high to find them. And there's not many of them. So we have a tremendous diversity of forests around here. Each of these forests needs to be managed differently. You really can't just go in there and do a one-size-fits-all thing. So ecological forestry looks at what type of forest is this naturally? How has it been disturbed and is not, not fitting that natural model as best it could be? And what can we do to bring it back or to increase its, its diversity and potential on there? But this is really, you know, tremendously complex system we have around here. And it takes a lot of care and, and knowledge to figure it out. Um, what makes things so diverse? Well, as I mentioned, elevation is the number one thing. 
essentially every about 10 feet, you go up about like going three miles north. So you go up, you know, 2,000 feet from in town to the top of Mount Mitchell, going up 4,000 feet. And that's like going, you know, a couple of 500, 600 miles north and you wind up in Canada. So we get all the forest types that occur in much cooler places down here as well. The aspect of a, of a, of a land form is very important. If you're south facing, it's much drier, a very different forest. On the other side of that mountain, the north side, you'll have a very different kind of forest, moister and shadier over there. Um, the land former position, if you're in a concave cove that's collecting moisture and collecting nutrients, much more productive. Forest only from the top of a ridge is very dry and rocky, and the nutrients have to leach off those sites, not as productive. So soil moisture and the soil types also can greatly influence things. And we have all those things in diversity. This forest here has nine different forest types on this property we looked at in NLI. It's actually computer modeling there to predict these things. Um, but a greatly diverse forest out there, and it's a wonderful thing to have. The second part of that isn't just the species diversity and the types of forest, it's actually the structures of the forests we have. And I mentioned that our forests here are kind of in a midlife crisis, and that red box in the middle of the screen there, most of our forests, probably 85% of them, are in that mid, kind of midlife stage. They're not very old, they're maybe 60 to 80 years old, somewhere in that range. And that is a very, you can see a very continuous, even canopy across the top of the forest here. And not much happening in the understory, maybe beginning to get some regeneration, but not maybe the desirable things. It's very shady, you're only getting the shade tolerant trees down there. We have very little of the old growth forest left. If there is any old growth forest, that should be preserved and just, you know, stewarded to keep in good health. And we also have very little of these young forests over here that happen after a disturbance or a clearing has happened. And you'll get literally, you know, tens of thousands of young trees coming in here. And that's a very, very different habitat type that a lot of wildlife really like to have that dense thicket for their, for their young to be in. And we don't have that much anymore. So we need to increase more of that for wildlife. And we also need to preserve and try and increase old growth. And you can do some things to try and push these forests in the middle, either to be old growth faster or to create more of this early successional young habitat. An old growth forest isn't just big old trees. Yes, there are some big old trees, but there's also medium sized trees and there's small trees, all ages in there. You'll even will find little patches where a big tree has fallen down and died, where you'll have little patches of young, very young forest in the middle of the old growth. So it's a very complex ecosystem. Most of the forests are in the middle here and that high grade harvesting I talked about, what they do, they come in here and the trees that are in blue here are the biggest, most valuable trees. Those are also the ones that grew the best, were the best adapted to the site, had the best genetics, they grew the fast. Those are the ones that are typically harvested under these high grade harvests, which we definitely do not recommend. And they leave behind the, the less vigorous trees. And then maybe 10, 20 years later, they can come in and cut out the red trees, which will have a little less value because they're not quite as, weren't quite as robust trees. And maybe 30, 40 years later, they can come and cut out these green trees and they grow a little bit slowly. But it really has greatly diminished the quality of our forest here. It's taking off these, the best trees have been removed and we're left with these poorer trees and a much less diverse um, understory than is left behind that is not always desirable, unfortunately. So um, I'll talk about oak a lot. Um, here's a standard inventory of an oak forest around here. And you can see um, these areas I've circled here are the oak components. And you can see for trees that are more than 12 inches in diameter, up to being more than 24 inches, two feet in diameter, these bottom three colors, the blue, magenta, and yellow, are oak species. Three oak species that really dominate the overstory, the large trees that are more than a foot in diameter, are mostly oaks. But once you get down to the smaller trees that are trying to hang out in the shade and survive, these two red circle areas, those oaks decrease drastically. Oaks cannot tolerate the shade. They need sun to grow and they're not getting that. They also been fire, they're not getting fire. What's taken over in the shade here has been maple trees, which is the purple color you see here, and this dark blue is birch trees. Those are much more shade tolerant and moisture liking trees, and the, the shady forest floor is much moister now. So we're getting a, a dramatic change in forests that really were naturally oak forests have cha are changing now um, to being more dominated by things that are not as beneficial for wildlife. And oak is really the keystone species for about those acorns are feasted on by you know literally hundreds of species of insects and then up the food chain from there everything from birds to bears relies on acorns as a key key food source uh, throughout the fall and into the winter even they last so that that's been a big problem as oak forests are changing over and oaks are really declining 
and becoming much less common. That's a big, big factor as to how to manage our forests. Um, other things, again, I talk about a diverse, vigorous forest is much better if it, whatever stresses come on, whether it's invasive plants or climate change, it's better wildlife habitat, stores more carbon. If it's diverse, actually, it turns out that those trees don't compete as much if they're different species and can store more carbon. It helps protect soil and water quality. And just seeing a more diverse forest just looks better. Um, it also allows you to have better chance of making, if you want to make profit off of a timber harvest or something, having a diversity of trees like a diversity of stocks. If you just have one tree, you only have one stock and timber markets are volatile and things change. It may not be a good investment in the future as it was now. So having diversity is really important for both the health and even for economics. Uh, so to do implement positive impact forestry and take some time, you really got to map things out here. Here's a forest land we were doing a timber harvest on. We had to make sure we set up where the stream crossing was going to be, protecting water qualities first and foremost. And it's actually not the cutting of trees that causes damage to the water quality. It's the road building and the ground disturbance. So laying out the roads and the stream crossings especially to minimize those and make sure that there's minimal disturbance, disturbance of the soil is the key factor in keeping, the, allowing the trees to regenerate healthy. The trees will grow back. It takes time, um, but they will grow back. And that will, having timber harvest will create that early successional young forest habitat and also allow you to harvest some of the more common trees and leave the more uncommon trees to increase your diversity of your forest. Um, so we're marking individual trees to be harvested. And here in this picture, the bottom left is an important picture to call your attention to. If you look at this picture, this is a stand of trees. And there are three trees in the front. This one with the blue ring on it. And there's a, another tree here, another tree here. And most people assume that um, this tree here is the oldest tree. Well, this actually is a pine plantation. These trees were all planted on the same day. They are the exact same age. Some just grew a lot better. This one here with the blue ring, we've marked to save that tree, leaving the bigger, better tree. And then we're gonna cut these smaller trees that really have not grown very well and are kind of suppressed, stunted trees that are not gonna be future good trees. Cut those trees, allow more sun to come in to regenerate a more diverse mix in this white pine plantation, get some hardwoods coming in and cut out the smaller trees. Um, so that has to be done. You have to bring some machinery in, but a, a good operator can come in there with fairly minimal disturbance, come in there and remove some of the trees you want to remove. And the key to a timber harvest is not so much what you're cutting, but what you're leaving or what you're going to encourage to grow in the future and make sure it's going to come back at least as good and hopefully better than before and do some restoration from the past management. And there were lots, you know, thousands of acres of white pines planted through the mountains here when people abandoned pasture land and cropland in the past decades. And it's, has not, it's the least diverse forest type. You see very little growing on the forest floor. So trying to convert that to a more diverse forest type is a key, a key aim of ours. Um, another important factor is it's really important to, to be humble out there and, and make sure you're looking at being very careful and judiciously applying these treatments to try and mimic what would happen naturally with those disturbances. So we're not talking about clear cutting, we're talking about doing maybe some small group selections. And we'll talk about specific things you can do to manage your forest in ways that are beneficial. But things that would hopefully increase the diversity of species and it definitely will increase the structural diversity at different ages of trees, you'll get some young, more young trees growing. You wanna leave some of the big older trees to leave that old growth habitat out there and create different stages. And you can make money doing this in the forest. Um, in all these past conditions and what do you want the future condition to be here? Things are changing. Um, we can't go back, we have to go forward. The key is to do it at a scale that mimics the natural disturbances. That's one of the keys to ecological forestry, to positive impact forestry is, is doing things at a scale that would be similar to what, what would have happened in nature in a more mature, even an old growth type forest to create those kind of smaller scale disturbances and increase the forest diversity out there. And that can be done to bring forests, make them grow faster into more old growth conditions and create the very young forest at the same time. So I'm not gonna go into this, this slide in detail, but for mention for oaks, if we don't do anything in our oak forests, something is still happening. Not, not doing anything to a forest, not managing it is a management decision and that will change the trajectory of the forest. As I said, oaks are tend to be declining and are not regenerating and things like maple and birch and sourwood and, and the rhododendron is really increasing and taking over. But we can do some things. We can, we can do some harvesting in there, these, these group selections, you know, half acres, maybe two acres max. 
um, harvesting all the trees there to create some young growth, some young forest growth, and also to allow in more sun. Oaks need a little bit of sun. Uh, they don't do well in really full sun usually, but on these edges, they do really well on the edge of these gaps here. So that kind of st that structural diversity helps lead to species diversity too, because one of the big differentiating factors for trees is their availability to handle <clears throat> different amounts of sunlight. Trees have different shade tolerances. The other thing is to put fire back on the landscape. Oaks benefit from fire, so burning the forest can burn, burning the oak forest can really benefit them greatly, as well as the yellow pine forest I mentioned earlier. There's oak and pine forests. Pine plantations, you know, traditional management was you clear cut it and you densely replant pine. We don't do that. Ecological management, here we've marked some of the hardwood trees with red rings to leave. There were some hardwoods that came in the pine plantation. Let's leave those and we'll cut out, especially some of the smaller pines, maybe leave some of the bigger pines around to create a more diverse forest. So having just one species dominate the site, let's make it have as many as it can, which, you know, around here it can be quite a few tree species can grow on just about any site. So you can do some things to work with these pine plantations, especially to convert them um, to more diverse forests. And even, even doing a small clear cuts and just removing all the pine trees, if you have a native hardwood seed source around, can actually allow much more diverse forests to come in afterwards. It's better for wildlife and also is a healthier forest because it's not susceptible. These pine plantations are susceptible to southern pine beetle outbreaks that can wipe out the whole plantation. It's all one species. So it's making a a diverse and more safe investment of a forest as well at the same time. Really quickly here, this is um, a forest. If you're managing a forest, the first thing to look at is where areas are ecologically sensitive. Do you not want to have a disturbance that are in good health, in good shape? And the best thing you can do is leave them alone. And these areas in blue here, which are a lot of them are the stream, stream corridors. You don't want to disturb the stream areas, leave those alone. There was a little bit of old growth in this forest too. Leave those areas alone, the areas in blue. Areas in red were, were very fire adapted. They were south-facing south, south facing or west-facing dry slopes that could benefit from having fire restored to them, as was the history of these sites for thousands of years to again, increase the oaks that grow on those higher, drier sites. Other areas, you know, there's some dark green where there is timber value, you can do some restoration and make a profit. And then the lighter green, maybe areas that don't have as much value in them, but you could still do some work to increase diversity there. Um, and then the brown areas are areas where it's really not mature timber. Um, you could do some restoration work there, create some early habitat, but there's no value. And this, this actually is all done actually by using remote sensing. The tree heights, we can tell the size of the trees out there and where it's appropriate to do what kind of actions. You have to, of course, go out there, get boots on the ground and do a thorough assessment on the ground before any work takes place. But you can get a good idea of where to go and what to look for um, by, remote, by remote assessment of things. But of course, the on the ground is needed to really check for things out there. So that's a quick thing there. And then you can rec recommend things. On, in a plan, I recommend you know, controlled burns, doing thinning with those group selections. We'll talk about other forest and improvements to crop tree release. Um, you have to control invasive species. That's a really, really important thing. And maybe you have a special area, a, a rare forest type, where you can have a botanist come in and really look at, hey, I may be worthy of, of preserving that. Let's check it out. Are there some rare species there? A lot of things to look at in a forest. This is a sample forest management plant outline. Uh, all the things we can recommend in a forest. So I want to give you some examples here of work we've done. So this is a, a dry, a xeric means a dry oak pine forest. And here we're actually trying to restore fire to this place. And the first thing we're going to do is actually harvesting. These are white pines here we're harvesting that are not fire adapted and are very common. And we're leaving behind the much more uncommon, the shortleaf pine that used to be very common, was very fire adapted, and things like pitch pine that also is, are much more uncommon and need really benefit from fire, need fire to clear out the understory and help them to regenerate. Some trees actually need fire to regenerate. And so first thing is cutting off the trees here that were not really adapted to the site and then restoring fire to hopefully restore it to this, this you know, dry oak pine, almost open savanna that's become a very, used to be a very common forest type and is very uncommon now. You don't see forests that are this open much anymore. They're much denser now. And that's because fire suppression. Well, we can do some timber harvesting to help speed up the process of restoring the fire regime in these forests as well. So the timber harvesting combined with fire can really do speed up the process of restoring these forests to their natural fire adapted state much more quickly. Um, another thing that's common around here is a lot of times the rich coves you know, were cleared for agriculture and they were abandoned 50 years ago and yellow poplar grows the fastest of all the trees here. So with full sun, yellow poplar dominates these sites. 
And we can go in there and harvest some of the yellow poplar to create more space, these small gaps in the forest, letting in some sun to get some young tree growth happening there. You can see where the logger's been driven in here and harped in some harvesting. Giving the trees, leaving some big trees with more space to grow bigger faster and become kind of old growth like sooner, but also creating more space in there for young trees to grow. Um, and that's something that, again, increases both the species diversity by allowing a mixture of fun like conditions for other trees, other different kinds of trees to grow, and creates a different structure in the forest, much more open forest structure there that will provide different types of wildlife habitat. That's the second common treatment we do. Um, the next one here, a shelter wood harvest, commonly done in oak forests. Again, you have a very dense forest here. And what we're doing here is actually leaving well-spaced, nice, good, healthy, mature oak trees to keep producing acorns, the seed source and the wildlife food source, but then cutting all the other smaller trees out of there, kind of the less desirable, less valuable trees out of there. It's still enough to make some profit off of, but allows more sun to come in, which the oaks need to regenerate. And again, you can also combine it with a burn to make it even better. But this allows young oaks to regenerate. And it also saves um, a real different component here of having this old growth forest, or not old growth yet, but faster growing mature trees to become, have more old growth characteristic growing. And then a lot of younger trees in the understory can come along and hopefully get young oaks happening as well as the old oaks. And you could come back and harvest some of these bigger trees in 10, 20 years, or you can leave them for aesthetics and for wildlife for the future. Uh, it gives you some flexibility there for what you can do in your future forest. So this is what the forest again looked like, you know, a lot of times 200 years ago, there were much more open forests that were, had been burned frequently. Um, they were much more open and it was a very different habitat type that we really don't have much of today uh, for wildlife. Um, then there are things we can do on forests that are younger forests, kind of very dense forests here, a lot of competition going on. You know, probably most of these trees will die due to natural competition. So we can do, go in here and we can actually intentionally, these trees you see, these skeleton trees you see, have been killed um, intentionally to release space for more desirable neighboring trees. We're picking trees that are less common or have value for wildlife or value for timber, whatever your goals are. But you actually can take um, some control in here of this really dense, dense structure of forest and thin it out, leaving the trees you want to encourage and have be part of your future forest to make it a more diverse and hopefully a healthier forest too by deaden the trees that may not be as healthy or as well suited to that site. That's something you can, that, that's a, a, what's called a forest stand improvement, which is an investment in your forest. Um, takes money, but hopefully it's an investment that will pay off in the future with a healthier, more diverse, and more valuable forest for all values. So that's something that can be done as well. You mentioned prescribed burning. Again, some plants need prescribed fire. It may not look good right after the fire, but give it a growing season or two in this lower right-hand corner this is the kind of forest that was once very common, these open woodlands that you could, again, ride your horses through, no problem. And that's really rare now. And it's something that's actually really good for wildlife, having these young grasses down here. It's more open, so different types of birds can fly through here. It creates a whole different forest type, a different habitat for, for wildlife. Um, this is something that Nature Conservancy and a lot of groups are trying to encourage this habitat, restore a lot more of this habitat type around here that used to be very common and is really quite rare now. Um, so quickly, other things here. So even if you don't want to do any, you know, you don't want to disturb your forest in any way, you want a healthy forest and do minimal management of it, you have to control, if you have non-native invasive species here, you can see kudzu, of course, just literally taking over swaths and growing up and over and killing the trees on the forest edge here. Um, they need to be controlled, no matter what you want to do with your forest, invasive species. If you do nothing, they will get worse. And they're, they're pretty much everywhere around disturbed areas near town. The farther away you go, they're a little less of a problem, but they're still there and they're still gonna come on. So you gotta keep an eye out for these. Erosion control, a lot of the old forest roads that were built when they did that logging 100 years ago were not built well. And there's old road beds that are often become nothing more than ditches now, causing erosion problems. And you can do that forest and improvement work. But unfortunately, you know, the forests are not taking care of themselves anymore because of the non-native invasive species, the plants, the insects, um, climate change. We need to do some, give our forests some help here um, to come back from all the challenges that are facing them. So even if you don't want to do a timber harvest, a lot of people don't, and that's fine. Um, there's still a lot of things you, you can do, you really need to do to tend to your forest that it needs some help on. Um, and you have to monitor it. You have to go in, monitor, and there's a place you can actually can go back in and 
re reassess the forest every 10 years and see if what you do is working. And maybe it's not working. You have to change, change course a little bit uh, as, things, as you figure things out in these very complex forests. A um, couple important points for incentives for managing your forest. If you, if you do want to manage your forest, and including doing some timber harvesting when you do have mature trees and it will be profitable to, to harvest timber, if you want to do that, the, forest, the state will actually will give you a major property tax break for managing your forest under a sustainable sound forest management plan. Um, it does have to include timber harvesting, but you do not have to clear cut your property. You can do all those things I talked about, group selection, shelter wood harvest, thinnings, all those things can be done. And that allows people basically to allow them to be able to afford to keep their forests because you could develop land around here, especially in your town for you know, $10,000 an acre is the going price of you know, bare land. Um, but with forests on it, you can't make that kind of money off of, off of you know, forest management. So they're willing to tax you at a much lower rate if you're willing to keep it in forest. You have to keep it forested and make sure it stays forested sustainably as long as you're in this program. So that is one great way of getting tax savings if you manage your forest. Um, you can really help people keep the forest. People often have are land rich but cash poor. allows you to keep that, that land base you have. A couple more slides. If you do want to harvest timber, do not. Uh, have a forester, have someone who knows about the trees, about how to do it properly. Don't just sell it directly to a logger or a mill because the, the standard practice is to do that high grade harvest and just cut the valuable trees and leave the less valuable ones which degrade your forest. So find someone that knows what to do, which trees to cut, which trees to leave to make sure it regenerate. Um, make sure you get a trained logger. Protect the residual trees that aren't being cut. What you leave is very important and make sure things will regrow. And make sure you get a performance deposit from the buyer so that if they do damage things and things don't turn out right, you have some of their money to fix things up afterwards. And hopefully you never need that, but it's a really important uh, thing to have in place in case things do get damaged or have problems, they cut trees they shouldn't have cut, whatever went on. Things can go wrong out there. Um, there are also some cost share things you can do to control things or invasive species control, controlled burning, and doing those forest and improvement things we talked about. Everything from you know crop to release, stream restoration, those things. You're, there can be some funding to offset some of those costs to improve your forest out there. Um, if you want more information? Let me know. It's the NRCS that does that mostly. You also can manage your forest for ginseng, mushrooms, other medicinal plants like cohosh. Uh, carbon sequestration, unfortunately, is only profitable if you own a couple thousand acres or more. Um, people are working on trying to make it more uh, more possible for smaller owners, but they have not got there yet. You can do, you can lease your land, conservation easements, do certification on your land, other, other possibilities. Um, so I kind of blitzed through things there very fast. Uh, sorry for rushing, a lot of ground to cover, but uh, we got at least five minutes. I'm definitely open to questions now. Great, thank you so much, Andy. We do have a couple of questions that have come in, so I'll go ahead and start reading them out to you. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what is the cost for your services to evaluate and plan for a small forest site, 10-ish acres? Yeah, um, so if you wanna find out usually specific information, I feel my contact info is there, phone number and emails there. Um, it depends, we could just consult on an hourly basis as needed for things. Um, for small properties, usually the best thing to do is just go out there and charge an hourly fee for things. And it's the standard going rate for forest. There's a bunch of options we can give you uh, on things, but that's something that I'll, kind of keep a, you know, for personal questions like that, feel free to call or email me with any questions you have on things like that, and we can follow up with that. Be happy to help people. Great, the other question we have right now is, how do you deal with invasives coming in when timber is harvested? Yeah, really, really important question. That is essential. Um, if you're gonna do a timber harvest or any kind of disturbance, developing, putting in a road or a home flood or anything, you need to control the invasive plants first before you do any timber harvesting. And this is a, a really hard thing because a lot of people call me and they want to do a timber harvest. And I go out there and I say, you know what, you've got invasive plants out there. You can't do it now. You have to, you know, spend some time and or some money on controlling these invasive plants first, because if you do a timber harvest or any other kind of disturbance, even a natural disturbance happens, the invasive plants will quickly take up that growing space and further degrade your forest. That's what, that's how they, they thrive on. Invasive plants love, you know, disturbances, or roadside edges are where they come in. And so you have to control the invasive plants before you do the timber harvest and you got to monitor afterwards to make sure it is sustainable. The, the native trees will regrow and then the invasive plants won't take over. Um, so that is, that's a real, real major issue around here. 
uh, for sustainable timber harvesting? Yeah, great question. And we have, we do provide that service too. We do invasive plant control if anyone has that issue out there on things. I don't see any other questions right now. So if folks have questions, go ahead and type those in the Q&A and I'll have Andy field them. But we don't have any more right now. Is there anything in the chat box, Katie? No. All right. Let's give people a minute. Uh, but we are coming close to the end of our time. So, um, Oh, I see one popped up in the Q&A. Yeah, we had another question come up that says, the large fires that we had recently at Lake Lore, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the forest? Yeah, another great question. And the severe drought, so forest fires are a little rare around here, not as big a problem as they are out west. Um, but during drought times, we can have severe forest fires. And part of the reason why is because the past 100 years of fire suppression, the fuel loading in the forest here has gotten to be high, so we can have those damaging fires now. So it's really important that we do kind of restore a natural, more low intensity fire more frequently to these woodlands so we don't have those extreme fires. And those extreme fires, though, however, are not all bad ecologically. They did get too hot some places, but that also is part of the natural history. Some places would burn hot and would actually be what they call a stand replacing fire. And that would happen on those really high, dry ridge tops. You know, the, the trees would get burned up, even the big trees. But usually what we're looking for around here is a, is a more low intensity fire that may burn up the mid-story, understory, but the mature trees should be able to survive it. Um, that's something we, it is more natural thing. So restoring a more natural fire frequency will help hopefully reduce some of those extreme fires that did happen back in the drought of 2016. And some of those were too hot, but some of that creates, and then the diversity, uh, uh, diversity of intensity of the fires is good. Having some low intensity spots and some higher intensity spots helps create that forest diversity too. So yeah, another good question. I mean, a question come in about yellow poplar that says, for yellow poplar dominated forest, would you keep the largest ones or try to remove the largest to open up the canopy for other trees to replace them? Yeah, I, ideally, ecologically, you leave the largest ones. Those are the ones that are all probably the same age. Um, the largest one just grew better, faster, had better genetics or had a better, little better microsite. And those are gonna be the healthier, better trees. So if you have a choice, Sometimes because of economic concerns, you have to harvest some of the bigger ones, but in general, it's good to leave the bigger ones and harvest the smaller ones if they're big enough to make a profit on. Um, and you don't need to harvest all of them. You can definitely leave some. Yellow poplar is a native and very common tree under any conditions, uh, but some places it really has dominated because it's the fastest growing tree in full sun. So all those, all those clear cuts that took over or abandoned pastures were quickly overtaken by yellow poplar often. So yeah. Great, we had another question just come in from Grady and Kathleen who come every month, um, <laughs> some of our more loyal supporters. So they wanna know, they say they live in a community with homes surrounded by forests on a slope mountain. What issues should they be thinking about? Yeah, uh, the two most common things on, you know, if you've got house sites around there is, you know, it's been the de development there, disturbance, roads been built, house sites have been cleared, non-native invasive plants is the first thing to make sure Usually you'll see those along the edges of your of your roads or on the edges around your cleared house sites where there was disturbance, that's where they get a chance to get a foothold. And the second thing would be to take a look at the forest type to see if, if fire is a risk there or not. Um, if you're on a south facing slope, it can be a higher risk. Um, but usually around here, you can take some steps. If it is a problem, you can take some steps to control it. If you have dense shrubs of mountain laurel or rhododendron around you, that, that could be slightly risky there. Um, but there are things you can do. There's a program called FireWise. If you just Google North Carolina FireWise, um, they have some really good literature about how to make um, houses and their landscaping more fire safe so that you won't have problems with fire. It's managed properly. So yeah, no, more good questions. Okay. Again, if you have questions, again, my, my office phone number, feel free to call the office phone and my, the office email are there. Um, or check out our website for more information. We're, we're more than happy to answer questions. Um, well, thank you. Comes up. Thank you, Andy. I didn't realize you are a 501c3. You are a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep. 
All right. Yeah, it's kind of a well, new model. Um, we're trying to take the profit incentive out of forestry, which has led to some of the unsustainable forest management practices. And um, you know, if we do work, we charge an hourly fee. We don't work on commission because if I'm working on a commission, that gives me an incentive to make as much money as possible, which means cutting as much many trees as possible, which is often not the best thing to do. So it's, it's a different model to try and um, look at forest management. And we also do nonprofit work that's purely uh, trying to benefit the forest and help people, educate people, and um, do outreach and work with conservation groups and people that have forests, help them manage them well. So I welcome your questions. Excellent. And, and how many worker bees have you got? Uh, we have a staff of six people here in Asheville, and we do have one person in Vermont actually working for us and we do have a seasonal crew also of non-native invasive plant control people that four additional crew were hired to help out during the growing season to help control non-native invasive plants so uh, i guess we have 10 folks right now uh, working for us so and we're happy, to happy to provide those services or help out however we can well thank you andy thank you very much this has been very interesting i've learned a lot and um, thank you everyone for hanging in there with us and joining us tonight and and do come back do do come back in august uh, and we'll have tony dunn um, talking about those terrible fires out in in california and a, a climate refugee so we'll see you next time. Thank you, Katie Morris. Katie has been our um, AmeriCorps staffer for two years now, and she's going to go on to graduate school. So a special goodbye to, to Katie, and thanks for your help. Good help. All right, signing off Green Drinks. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>